always been very interested in my work, not only in the medical or the clinical side of how um, new kinds of cells are being made, um, and in particular how cells from plants, animals, and humans are made into tools, um, into technologies, which has really been my main focus throughout. Um, but I've also been very interested in how these issues um, become part of what you might call public debate, you know, how they're debated in public, how they're debated in Parliament, how they're debated um, in ordinary situations, in the pub, whatever, and also how um, new ideas of the biological are manifest in advertising and in new kinds of products. And, you know, as someone who's watched the language of DNA evolve, it, it has been very, very interesting to watch that language come into ordinary speech, then become something that has become part of brands and products and cosmetics and so forth, and now is used as a figure of speech, say, to talk about a corporation. You know, IBM has got, you know, diversity in its DNA kind of thing. Um, and so uh, I've always been interested in trying to look at those aspects of the question as well, um, which you, you could call the sociological aspects or the anthropological aspects, I think. So just to start today, I wanted to just give you a little glimpse of one of my favorite incidences of public debate from Britain. Um, and all of my work has been based in the UK, which has a very distinctive history of um, making new kinds of biological entities um, and debating them. So fortunately, I think the technology is working well. <laughs> and uh, so we just have a little look at this little clip, which is from an evening um, program called Have I Got News For You, which is a kind of satire of the week's news events.
decided to legalize um, the use of cow embryos with human DNA with relatively little uh, public outcry. There wasn't any amendment to the legislation and there was sort of minimal demonstrations, but in general, the UK has a very um, tolerant um, attitude towards that kind of technology. Um, so um, for me, this um, TV show it kind of um, epitomizes a certain ease that exists in the UK towards um, manipulation of cells and the production of um, human-animal hybrids, which is really quite different from um, the United States, where especially because of the um, connections to abortion, embryo research, etc., these issues tend to have a much more controversial profile. Um, and there tends not to be any <coughs> legislation at all, because it's almost impossible to have anything related to these topics um, survive the congressional process um, here. So, um, leaving that behind, let's go on to, I'll just say, I'll just, I really don't want to take very long at all with this. Um, I um, just want to say a little bit about the um, Jolly work um, and its <coughs> connection to what I'm doing now. <coughs> so, um, one of the charms I've been trying to work with, but not consistently, really more, I would say, experimentally, I guess, is this idea of trans biology, a biology that is made up out of elements that are transferred from one place to another, um, moved around and um, put places that wouldn't normally be, um, which is what a lot of the history of experimental biology in the 20th century is, moving bits and pieces around. Um, not necessarily trying to work out how things would work the way they are already working, but trying to make them work in some way that they wouldn't normally work, like by moving the nucleus of a human into an egg of a cow. Um, and the other part of this term is, is translation, which is just the new word for application. But the <laughs> idea of taking basic science and translating it into new products is absolutely the basic financial and political infrastructure of science today. So the translational effort to make new biological entities is what I call the trans-biological. Um, <clears throat> but like I say, it's just a bit of an experimental idea, which I put, first put in that article. So I did work up this idea very much um, in relation uh, to um, Dolly the sheep, um, which is named for a ubiquitous type of British candy, um, which is made up of different components. Um, these are actually small um, versions of a former candy, um, because dolly in Britain is used to refer to the diminutive um, of, it, of anything. And they used to be called empire mixtures, and they used to be larger. And it's interesting because in dolly mixtures, there were five chapters, you know, sex, nation, capital, um, colony of debt. But there was a sixth chapter that I really, really wanted to write um, called Empire um, that would have been about the merino sheep, um, which is the world's most common sheep and a very interesting animal in terms of its history, in terms of the mutation that makes the fiber so long and fine, in terms of its production in Spain where it was the basis of the first um, corporation, the Mesta. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But I didn't, couldn't put um, Empire in. Actually, I think I might write a sequel to Dolly Mixtures about um, the Merino. Um, but um, the basic idea of the Dolly book is the trans biology idea that um, by mixing, by adding greater mix to biology, by adding a greater variety of components to biology you can produce something that's you know, literally better than sex. Um, 
because sex is really a limited way to reproduce. Sexual reproduction is um, advantageous in terms of being able to generate greater genetic diversity, but it's very inefficient and it does generate a lot of pathology. Um, so the most common form of reproduction is asexual reproduction, which is much more efficient, much more predictable, um, but it's, it's not, not so great for adaptation, really. But the word colonia comes from the Greek word for twig, and it actually relates to vitriculture, making wine, because if you take any fruit tree, it won't breed true if you uh, plant a seed. Um, so you need to take a twig, um, which is basically taking a clone. Um, so most fruit is cloned, and um, these clones, you know, taken from a picture in California, would be um, an early way to manipulate the vine in such a way that the grapes can be easily harvested in order that you can maximize the productivity of the soil by planting the maximum number of plants per acre. So uh, uh, while this, you know, is a very ancient technology, I mean, um, dating back to all of the ancient civilizations, um, and while obviously genetic engineering is completely different in many respects from viticulture, the, the combination of the manipulation of the stock, you know, the um, advantageous use of the soil, the um, harnessing of a specific kind of reproduction, and the organization of all of that together into a system is, in many ways, the model that is being used in stem cell propagation, which is what it's used. You know, when you have a line, a stem cell line, and you're training it to grow on a certain kind of soil, so culture media, so you can harvest it effectively. Okay, I don't want to push the analogy too far, but I think it would also be a mistake to overlook how much in common stem cell technology has with quite basic forms of propagation. So I just want to mention that point because, um, come back to that in a minute. Um, so Jolly the Sheep was made in order to test a specific kind of reproduction that would be more efficient than the previous way of getting human DNA into a sheep. Um, because Dolly was made in order to um, establish a more effective mode of reproduction for the company that was manufacturing a product that could aid and the alleviation of cystic fibrosis by getting the missing gene into the lungs of people affected by that disease, by putting the um, DNA that makes that gene into a sheep and extracting the enzymes that that, that gene makes from the milk of the animal, so-called farming, P-H-A-R-M-I-N-G. Um, but the normal way to get the human DNA into the embryo of the sheep is by hand, to just drop some of the DNA on top of the embryo and hope that it takes, but it only takes about one in 200 times. So if you could figure out a way to take one shape that already has the human DNA in its body and to clone it, so you didn't have to use sexual reproduction with all of its inefficiency, you would have a way of making flocks of animals that have the right metabolism to manufacture the drug much more successfully. Okay, now, so Dolly is not a transgenic but she was used to test out a means of what was called transgenesis, which is basically um, So, um, yeah, you probably don't, you know, take the nucleus of the sheep that you want, the sheep that has the human day DNA in it, although they didn't use those sheep, they just used regular sheep, um, put it in, sell another animal, give it a little shock, get it tipping over, and you get a clone of the original animal. That's called somatic cell nuclear transfer, which technically speaking, technically speaking, is not cloning. Okay, this is not taking a twig from one 
animal to make lots more animals. It's not. It's using several cells. In fact, it's using cells from three different animals. So actually, it's not the claim, but we, that doesn't matter so much. Um, so Tracy was the first sheep um, born in 1990, um, which sort of mixed together these two different types of breeding. Um, Polly and her sisters were born just after Dolly, um, adding a new genetic modification to improve transgenesis. Um, Taffy and Tweed, names for Welsh rivers, were cloned from cultured cells, also born in 1996, just like Dolly. Um, and um, Dolly was cloned from differentiated adult cells, so there are different steps in this process. And. Um, Megan and Morag, they were really the they were really the breakthrough animals. They were the ones that were born um, with cells from an animal that had been kept in culture, as well as an animal that had already gotten differentiated cells. So um, this is really just to show you lots of pictures of sheep. <laughs> 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 they used all different types of breeds of sheep, and and interestingly, they used. Um, for the <coughs> experiments, they mostly use what are called the highland sheep, mountain sheep, sheep that are very hardy, because sheep can undergo surgery very successfully, um, unlike pigs or cows or horses. Um, and sheep can be lifted by one person. So when you're doing lots of large animal surgery, the ability to actually lift up one animal at a time um, makes a big difference. And they recover from surgery very, very quickly. Like, they can have surgery, and pretty much as soon as they wake up, you know, they were going to run out of the room. Um, and they, so they have a very low mortality rate, and they, they're just quite tough, basically. Um, just, and they're cheap as well, um, which makes them perfect for these things. And they're, they're about the same size as a human, too. Um, small, um, 60, 70 kilos. Um, so they used to model. I mean, that's Dolly with her three. Um, lambs, and those lambs um, were traditionally bred, um, and they were bred largely to confirm that she was a normal animal. So she was an animal who was bred to confirm the viability of an experiment, and then she was bred to produce offspring to confirm her normality as a sort of additional proof of the viability of the technique. So again, I'm very, very interested in this layering of the different reproductive systems and the way they are used in alternating arrangements to produce not just a product, but to produce the system that produces the product. I mean, this, this is really what Marx was most interested in in almost all of Capital. He, he wasn't really interested in capitalism. He almost never uses the word capitalism. It almost doesn't exist in Marx's work. It's something people, I think, often misunderstand about his work, which was almost exclusively about agriculture in the early period, um, leading to his question about technology um, and the sort of dramatic evolution of technology in the northwest of England you know, during the Industrial Revolution, which he himself witnessed um, living in Manchester and also in London. and. Um, you know, this infrastructure of animals that was in the northwest of England was a huge <coughs> part of the infrastructure of the Industrial Revolution, as it is now the infrastructure of the so-called um, biotechnological or reproductive revolution. So um, these are some of the other sheep. Um, uh, I was not going to say much about this. Um, but, you know, it would be fair to say that um, in the post-war period, um, there has been a very, very substantial <coughs> increase in um, the development of new biological tools using various kinds of cells. So, um, one of the things that we would say is happening with um, the 
the, sh the shift that I think is quite important is the shift not only from what Marx described, where you have a, s a system, say crop rotation or certain kinds of animals eating certain kinds of plants on certain kind of soil in order to maximize the overall utility of the land. The, the shift that seems to be very, very important is uh, in the post-war period, the shift to making new biological tools. Okay? Like Mar Marx was very, very interested in tools. He actually was very interested in applying Darwin's theory of um, natural selection to tools. He starts um, his um, section in Volume 1 of Capital about tools with a quote from Darwin and about the differentiation of the species. And he's basically asking, would it be possible to apply Darwin's theory of the differentiation of the species to the differentiation of tools, um, a kind of tool evolution? And what, what's interesting is that he has this idea of tools and a sort of human tool animal relation being what he calls a very lively interface. Exactly the same term Don Haraway uses when she talks about it. And, and what we want to pay attention to, I think, is this liveliness of the tools becomes even more extreme when the tools themselves are alive, which describes exactly what happened post DNA, post molecular biology, and now, you know, in the era of you know, bio this and bio that, you have um, all these new tools. Um, so I'm just going to. Um, I just want to show you the last slide down here. Um, So just for the hell of it, really, um, I've proposed these two types of post-genomic life. Type one, which would be the engineer's model, which would be based on building code. Um, this would be the synthetic biology <coughs> model of you know, making an artificial cell from scratch, something that Craig Venter is continuing to do. Um, or you could have post-genomic life to the developmental biologist model, which is based on the cell. Um, and this is a sort of dialectic that's been also occurring in the post-war period between the idea of the DNA as the instruction or the code or the blueprint, and the idea of the cell as like the material or the um, entity or the object that would be made. Um, and over the past, um, 30 years or so, um, in the, towards the end of the 20th century and in the first part of the 21st century, the role of DNA has been very, very substantially lessened. I mean, it's just become increasingly less and less significant. So that um, with the Dolly experiment, one of the key shifts was the idea that the cytoplasm would tell the DNA what to do, and increasingly with the prominence of more epigenetic models, it, it's really clear that the DNA is not the driving entity. You absolutely cannot work with DNA on the assumption that it quote unquote codes for X or Y. It's a much more it's a much more two way process, and you have to understand the relationship between the cell and the DNA in order to work effectively with DNA. Um, and this is really one of the main lessons from the stem cell science. So there's really been a sh shift, I would suggest, towards this model. Um, in the life sciences in the attempt to build new life, there is a very significant shift towards a developmental model, which would be another way of saying a very significant shift towards understanding reproduction as a key component rather than merely hereditary or um, DNA, um, which, of course, from a feminist point of view makes perfect sense, but it does take science a little while to work these things out. Um, okay, so just to, um, to make a conclusion here for the sake of discussion, um, yeah, so it was among the many things the Dolly experiment shows, it was probably a mistake to emphasize the importance of genetic information and the understanding of new forms of biocop at all. They're probably never going to be very important to new forms of biocop at all. They certainly haven't produced any form of biocapitalism, you know. Um, 
And um, probably bio capital was going to look more like viticulture. Um, mixed reproductive strategies in which sex and development um, are programming as much as genes. That's my prediction. <coughs> um, a, a consequence of this is that um, the promissory futures of cellular potency um, are imagined as, as conversion from sort of raw <coughs> primordial substance into new health and wealth benefits. This is the production process that is at the moment reaching the quote unquote tipping point where it really scales up into more substantial biomanufacture. Um, and politically, biological transparency will refer to both how this is accomplished scientifically and how it's made more socially accountable. And this is another part of the trans biology thing I'm interested in. You know, why you can't just have the process, you have to have the social side of it too. Um, so, obviously I'm borrowing very substantially from Donna Haraway's absolutely brilliant cyborg model. Um, first articulated in 1985, almost exactly 100 years since Marx's death. Um, and, you know, these are the principles that she <coughs> argues we should have as political principles as well as within science studies. So I am trying to maybe extend that argument with this idea of transbiology, emphasizing continuity with the past, um, we often think of biotechnology in terms of the future, you know, and there's a very strong arrow towards future this and future that, but actually I think it's very um, helpful to look back in time. And um, I think this is the main thing I would want to emphasize that increasing contingency of biological facts and their ambivalence will bring the social inscription of biology to increasing prominence. So the question of how people are going to want to rewrite the biological will be one of the most prominent questions um, as this field moves forward. So, Okay, so I'm just going to leave it there. Um, and Sarah, yeah. would you mind? Just a small question. What 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 is your gloss mean under trans struggle, the analogic return? What okay. are you saying about it's a great phrase, life and dread. What what's going on? <laughs> okay. Um well it's a slightly more complicated argument, so I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but okay. Um so If you take something like, well, this is maybe helpful because it will say a little bit about what I'm doing now. I, I've just finished your book. I sent it in today. I'm so excited. Um, and um, all 562 pages. Thanks. And um, um, it, it's really looking at the history of in vitro fertilization, a bit the way I looked at the history of nuclear transfer. And like, okay, in vitro fertilization, the whole technique is named for a process that takes place in, in vitro that is supposed to replicate what would happen as it were naturally, right? Um, so in vitro fertilization in the petri dish isn't any different from what would have happened anyway, it's just that it's outside the body and then it gets put back inside the body. But the thing is that once you have in vitro fertilization outside of the body, it changes how you think about the reproduction that came before. And that's what analogic return is. By imitating something, you produce a new version of it. So now, for example, um, you know, the difference between assisted and unassisted conception is a legible difference, and you can get pregnant spontaneously as opposed to getting pregnant, you know, in a clinic. Um, and so this changes the meaning of um, the, very, the very biology, the very fact of imitating the biology changes what the biology meant before, which makes biology more contingent makes it more relative. Um, and so what it does for biology is exactly what you could say um, feminist theory argues gender does for sex, 
which is to the production of the illusion of an origin, which is, in effect, something that comes after, um, not before. It's not a very clear way to explain it. I apologize. But um, that is a whole argument I've made elsewhere about the effect of imitation and how it takes away one of the functions the biological used to have, which was to ground a certain version of something in natural fact. Because once you've imitated it technologically, you don't have that anymore. Thanks. I mean, Marilyn Strathairn has said something very similar as well great. along those lines. Thanks so much. Okay. It's just a great, it was a great phrase. Yeah, so I, I do. I bit. <laughs> I do have a whole thing on queer biology, but um, that's another, it's like a whole other, a whole other lifetime, really. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Thanks. <laughs>